Your Steve Jones Show podcast will start shortly. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Brewers Outlet, your beverage supermarket on Reagan Street in Sunbury. Sports talk where your voice counts. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. Today's show is brought to you by our good friends at Brewers Outlet, Reagan Street in Sunbury, the beverage supermarket. Imports, domestics, microbrews, best selection of beer anywhere. And Blue White Weekend, here are your Brewers Outlet specials now through Tuesday. Michelob Ultra 30 packs, just $22.97. Shock Top Ruby Fresh Grapefruit, 12 pack bottles. Just eight ninety five. Jack Daniels cocktails, twenty four pack bottles, twenty four ninety five, and now available Budweiser Freedom Reserve Red Lager. All at Brewers Outlet, Reagan Street, and Sunbury, the beverage supermarket. And don't forget, they have wine coolers, water, soft drink, snacks. They roast their peanuts fresh and hot every day. Pickle bar led by the barrels and the dills. Indeed, second to none. You can even pay off wagers in pickles. I've heard. And we're in the Sunbury Motors studio, Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury, Sunbury Motors, Kia routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Joe Marino in just a moment. First of all, our play-by-play call of the day, Joel Embiid back in the lineup in a big way. Here's Embiid, sighting by one man, underhand scoop up and good, down goes Olenek, down goes Adebayo, and Embiid high-fiving T.J. McConnell, the big man, the all-star center, is back. 23.7 23.7 boards, four assists last night for Joel Embiid. The masked man got it done last night. Great performance by him. That's our play-by-play call today. And, of course, Joel Embiid was the third overall pick in the NBA draft. We're now going to talk about picks in the NFL draft because a week from today it'll be rounds three and four. It's going to be round, rounds two and three a week from today. And then the week from tomorrow will be, of course, uh, four through seven. Joe Marino from FanRag. Uh, sports.com joins us. Hi, Joe. Great to have you with us. Hey, thanks for having me on. Looking forward to uh, this mystery finally being solved in less than a week. <laughs> and it is a mystery because uh, part of the mystery is uh, sitting right now about two miles from here, and that's Saquon Barkley. Uh, he's part of the mystery. Uh, Joe, what is your argument, pro and con, for drafting a running back high? Well, I think it comes down to whether or not you think this can be the true focal point of your offense and be the type of player that's going to compete to be among the league leaders in scrimmage yards on a year-to-year basis. And I think that you need to to really believe that that's true and that this can be the catalyst for your offense. And, um, you know, you certainly get that in Saquon Barkley. The, The issue is that there's just so many examples of guys that do that that are selected in the third or fourth round. We've got recent examples like... Uh, you know, Kareem Hunt and Alvin Kamara. But at the same time, I don't think there's any buyer's remorse from the Dallas Cowboys and their pick of Zeke Elliott or the Rams and their pick of Todd Gurley or even, you know, Leonard uh, Fournette, what he was able to give to the Jaguars last year. So um, it, the running back position is, is, is so polarizing because it seems like you get the high impact guys at all portions of the draft. And, uh, you know, they need to be a really special talent. And we've got one this year in Saquon Barkley. Which now brings me to Todd Haley. Todd Haley had this kind of talent, albeit he was a second-round pick, in Le'Veon Bell with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now he's with Cleveland. Is that any factor in this? Well, in terms of if if Saquon Barkley's in play for Cleveland, I don't think that he is at number one or number four because you know I'm really buying into him being the guy to the Giants at number two. And I think even if he were to be on the board, you know, at number four, if, if Bradley Chubb was also on the board, I think that the that the Browns would go with Chubb at number four. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that there's a, a lot to be said for those parallels that you could draw from Todd Haley and what he was able to get out of Le'Veon Bell. But uh, I don't know that he's going to be available because I think he's going to be the number two pick to the Giants. I agree with you that I also think he would be number two to the Giants as well. So now you get to the top. If Cleveland keeps that pick at one, who's the favorite son to throw the ball? 
Yeah, you know, and I think I do expect them to keep the pick, and I expect them to, to draft Sam Darnold, the quarterback from USC. I know that we've heard some stuff about Josh Allen here, and, and the hand size comments from John Dorsey yesterday are pushing people in that direction. And even Dustin Fox, one of their insiders out of Cleveland, has mentioned that Baker Mayfield's in contention. I still think this pick is, is still about Sam Darnold, and uh, and I'm not changing my mind yet. <laughs> Okay, what is it about Darnold? I, I will say this about Darnold. Uh, obviously, I, saw, I I did the game in the Rose Bowl, so I mean, I saw him at his best. Uh, but he also had great protection, and he had some pretty doggone good receivers. The fact that he does move around does that help him a little bit? Because no, Joe Thomas and Cleveland's offensive line not the greatest. Yeah, that certainly helps him a ton, and being able to move off of his spot and work outside of structure. He's a great processor. He sees the field super well. I know how to read defenses and, and how his routes are going to respond to those defenses and th- hits throws with anticipation and knows where leverage is going to be. He does that tremendously well, and he's you know, he's a clean character guy. And you, know, you hear some of the, the comments about Rosen and Mayfield and even Allen to an extent. Uh, you know, he's not that guy. He's going to be the company guy, and he, and you have no concerns about him stepping up and being the face of your franchise. So, you know, kind of the mental side of the game that he has, and his personality and, and his intangibles are really important. But at the same time, let's let's not forget that he's a bit rough around the edges with his mechanics, with his uh, with his footwork, is in you know his throwing motion is very concerning. So, and he didn't take a step forward like many expected this year. And, and so, some of those things do work against him. And he was a little bit loose with the football at times. So, you know. He's got some stuff to work on. He's not he's not an Andrew Luck or a Peyton Manning type prospect, but he's the player that I think an NFL team that has a number one pick is going to be most poised to select. I've mentioned on the show several times that uh, irony of all ironies, I've actually seen Josh Allen play in person. I had to, for the Penn State Michigan game a couple of years ago, I had to speak to the Penn State Club of Michigan, and it was at Eastern Michigan, and Wyoming was playing there that night. So at least I've seen him. You know he's got a big arm. What is the concern? Is it the level of competition, or is it more of an accuracy issue? Yeah, I think it really stems from accuracy and decision making. And you know, he's an overstrider, and it leads to erratic ball placement. But it's how he sees the field and processes it. And he's not a guy that you know really identifies things pre-snap and understands where coverage is and uh, understand where his routes are going to have leverage. And he just, he's a slow processor where he, you know, he wants that first read to be open. And even if it's not open, he'll force the ball in there. And, and he just doesn't have any methodical way about him and how he surveys the field and picks you apart. You know, NFL quarterbacks, you got to be able to win from the pocket and, and, and be a surgeon. And you don't see that from Josh Allen. You combine that with, you know, the the accuracy issues that stem from mechanical issues, he, he's a project. He's a player that I'm really surprised the NFL is primed to take in the top ten because he's more yeah. he reminds me more of a Deshaun Kaiser or even a Colin Kaepernick coming back coming out where this was a player that was more of a top of the second round pick that's that's rough around the edges in a project. But you know, some NFL teams primed to take him in the top ten and overlook that because he's big, athletic and throw the football seventy five yards in the air. Uh, that's exactly how I feel about it. I mean, if this was not a quarterback-centric league, he'd probably be a second-round pick. Uh, okay, uh, on your board, Joe, you mentioned Barkley. So we've got Barkley out there uh, as, as a great prospect. Give me three or four other guys that you know that no matter what the draft would have been over the last ten years, they still would have been first-round picks. Quentin Nelson, guard from Notre Dame, he's powerful. He's a strong mental processor, and, and he's tough to beat in pass pro. I think he has the upside to become the best offensive lineman in the NFL. Bradley Chubb, the defensive end from NC State, is a first-round pick in any draft. Uh, very high-variance vi- uh, uh, pass rusher. He wins in so many different ways, and he plays the run. Uh, I think he's a first-round pick every single year. And, and another name uh, that I'll throw out there, you mentioned Barkley already, but um, Tremaine Edmonds, the linebacker from Virginia Tech, I think that he has the ability to be the face of a defense, a, a true tone setter. He's 19 years old. He's got rare size and length. He wins in space. He wins playing into the line of scrimmage. He's one of my favorite guys this year. So I think those are kind of the blue chip, top of the first round guys that are going to be first rounders in any draft. Uh, what about Derwin James and Minka Fitzpatrick? Where do they fit in your mind? Very high, very high. Both of those guys are in my top 10 prospects for this year. And, and I love, you know, for Minka Fitzpatrick, and you talk about disguising coverages and, and how important that is to, you know, not letting quarterbacks get a read on the defense. He does that so well, and he can fill every role in the safety. And Derwin James, how well he excels playing down inside the box, 
lining up in man coverage. He can carry those bigger slots and tight ends down the seam, and he's a, he's an outstanding tackle and blitzer. So both of those guys, uh, top ten picks this year for me, and, and certainly first rounders in any year. Joe, let me throw it a little further down the draft. Mike Kosicki has had a really great off season after back to back terrific seasons here at Penn State. Where can he fit into this? You know, I think he comes into play uh, maybe as early as Carolina at 24, the Saints at 27, uh, both teams that can use a tight end and uh, value that, and it's important to their quarterbacks. You know, historically great scouting combine. He was awesome at the Senior Bowl. And I think what's a little bit concerning about Gusecki is that I think everybody thought he was fairly athletic, but he was historically athletic at the Combine. And so I think there is a bit of a disconnect between how well he timed and how fast he played on film. So I, that was something that I – you know, I, I wanted to go back and, and take a look at, and you know, he just he doesn't play that athletic, historically athletic, and he doesn't give you much in terms of a blocker. He's more of a flex guy, so and he's got a, an inline tight end body, but he doesn't block well. So he, he's got some funkiness about him because you, he, he wins in ways that you don't think he's going to based on his frame. Uh, but certainly, I think you know, end of the first round, he comes into play, and you know, I don't think he gets outside the top fifty or sixty picks. Is he helped by, you know, you and I both know trends happen in the NFL. Tradition also means something about the type of player. Is a guy like Asiki, who was a two-time player of the year in basketball in New Jersey and plays that tight end spot, obviously I've seen it, you know, firsthand, where he knows how to use his body like it's rebounding position. In a league that's had Antonio Gates, Tony Gonzalez, Jimmy Graham, does that help him in terms of perception? Oh, absolutely, because I think the team that invests in him high is going to think they're going to get that type of player, and I, and I think they do get that type of player. You know, like you mentioned, his basketball background, that's why he's, he's so dominant at the catch point. Things really slow down, and he knows how to win, win by boxing out and elevating and getting above the rim. And so, you know, that's such an important piece to being able to score touchdowns in the red zone and be a you know keep the chains moving, knowing that you can throw it up to that guy, and he knows how to go get it. And so... Yeah, all the the guys before him have really elevated his draft stock. You know, if you look years and years ago where they were looking for these rugged inline guys that, you know, can block and then catching was an afterthought, you know, it's just a different game right now. And so those those guys have definitely paved the way for Mike Kosicki to be as valuable as he is. Another guy that did really well at all-star games and combined well was Deshaun Hamilton. In all likelihood, you and I both know probably a second-day guy, but where where can he fit? Well, I think any team that has a, a timing-based offense where you know they really trust the receivers to get to a spot on schedule, the West Coast-type yeah. scheme, I mean, that's where you really get a lot of value from Deshaun Hamilton because he's such a, a razor-sharp route runner. He's so crisp. You know, you like to see him finish a bit more consistently. I mean, that was the big thing. He just I, the drops, he, very very frustrating drops, and it showed up at the Senior Bowl as well. Um, you know, you like to see that to be cleaned up, but he's one of the best two or three route runners in this class. Marcus Allen uh, could be second or third day guy, the safety, but also ha- can play closer to the line of scrimmage. What about him? Yeah, you know, I think the problem with him is that he doesn't give you much in coverage. He's very safe, keeps things in front of him, comes up and tackles, and he's a great tackler, and he's really good in run support. And like you mentioned, playing him in the box and close to the line of scrimmage, he knows kind of how to knife through those windows and make plays. But you know, in this day and age, these safeties, they have to be interchangeable and be able to win in split zones, deep zones, single high. You know, I think he's he's a little bit of a niche player, and that's going to hurt his draft stock. I think he'll be a core special teamer from day one. But right now, you know, he's more of a sub-package early down player because I don't know that he offers much in terms of pass defense. Okay, i going to get to a couple more quarterbacks quickly. Joe, appreciate the time very much. Baker Mayfield. Yeah, I think he's the second best quarterback in this draft. He's he's uh, he's got a powerful arm. He can hit accurately, uh, hit throws accurately to all levels of the field. He wins inside the pocket, and when things break down, he can extend plays. If he was three inches taller, he'd be the number one pick, and nobody would think twice about it. Lamar Jackson. I want to see him. I love the growth. The growth this year was tremendous. He sees a lot of zone coverage because they need eyes in the backfield because how well he can run. And he did such a good job this year of being able to hit throws between zones with anticipation. Love that. But he still needs to work on the vertical passing game. And any outbreaking pattern, he really he doesn't hit it very consistently. And some of his mechanics, he throws from a narrow base. So he needs some work. But I think that he can, he can be the, uh, the engineer behind a very high-powered offense in time. 
most likely to move up, most likely to fall to drop down. I think Denver's the team that I think is going to drop down. I know that they'd love to to pick up a couple of first round picks, maybe from Buffalo, maybe even from New England. We'll see on that. So Denver's the team I think is going to move back. A team I think is going to move up is Buffalo. You know, I, I, they didn't do all this over the last year to get this draft capital to trade away Tyrod Taylor to enter the season with Nate Peterman and AJ McCarron. They're going to make a play for a quarterback. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> Joe, absolute pleasure. Thanks so much. I know we, we did this quick taste and you handled everything perfectly. I'm not surprised. Real pleasure having you with us and also the information. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Joe Marino, draft analyst for FanRagSports.com. We'll come back with more in a moment as we continue on News Radio 1070 WKOK. I certainly feel like we're covering the draft thoroughly here. How many different analysts have we had on? Well, let's see. Joe Marino, Jason Lockenfora, uh, to name a few. A couple others. Uh, Char- Charlie Campbell. Charlie Walker Campbell football. earlier this week knocked it out of the park. He was excellent. Man, every time I turn around, I feel like we're doing something on the draft. And look, for Penn Staters, this is the most intriguing draft in, in years. I think it's the most intriguing draft. I was on a show today in Michigan. I'm on another one coming up in Ohio, uh, Cleveland, on Monday after this show's over with. And I think this is the most intriguing draft for Penn State. I think the obviously the... Uh, 2000 draft, the 1999 team, the 2000 draft with LeVar and uh, Courtney Brown going 1 2. Okay. And speaking of LeVar, back in State College this weekend. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, they've got that eighth grade All Star game in Beaver Stadium tomorrow. Uh, they were gonna, they were thinking about actually putting that over at Jeffrey Field, and they said, nah, 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 let's put it in the stadium. So LeVar's running that tomorrow, and then it, it is, I want to say it's his cousin, Darnell Dix. Nephew, because maybe it's his nephew, is a walk on to the team and has actually had a really good spring. I mean, you know, it's playing defensive end for the first time. He's done really well. And so, yeah, he'll be back. And then I would say, obviously, the 95 draft. I mean, there's certain drafts where it's been really signature Penn State drafts. The 86 draft, or excuse me, the 1987 draft off the 86 team. Loaded with Penn Staters all over the place. The 95 draft off the 94 team, loaded with Penn Staters all over the place. And, of course, that 2000 draft off the 99 team. You know, people forget 2002, Penn State had four first-round picks. The 2003 draft? I mean, people forget that Michael Haynes, Jimmy Kennedy, Larry Johnson, and Brian Johnson were all first-round picks. I was sitting there doing the blue-white game, and they kept handing me a card. I'm like, what? I mean, another guy got picked? And people forget about the 2003 draft. Four Penn State players in the first round. So. I thought that was interesting that Joe Marino brought up a little while ago about uh, Mike Kosicki. That's the first time I'd heard an analyst uh, tie Mike into Carolina. Pretty much everyone I, I've heard, you know, the perfect fit would be, you know, getting back with uh, Billy down in Houston. Or the Saints. I've heard a lot of the Saints. Now, as for Carolina, remember, they drafted Devin Funches. Devin Funches had been a tight end at Michigan. Now, Funches in his last year had been converted to wide receiver at Michigan. Well, Carolina drafted him, and he's played wide out for them. We'll be to see what they want to do with Mike if they do pick him. Now, that's... Uh... Yeah, you hear. Yeah, we've been able to hear a lot of names. That's it, it, the problem with with the draft is is that you do know that quarterbacks you have you can't get anywhere unless you have one. I mean, my goodness! I mean, look at the Eagles this year. They win the Super Bowl because they had they drafted the right quarterback in Carson Wentz, and they signed the right backup. 
in Nick Foles. And a good chance that backup is still going to be playing well into late September, depending on how fast Carson heals up. And they're paying what? what's the price for both of them? Round 15 this year? Yeah. That's well, a steal. Well, yeah. Ex- well, they're going to pay those two quarterbacks about 14 to $15 million combined. That is... That's still below the bar, the market for Aaron Rodgers and Russell Wilson. All right, great to have you with us on the show today. The Sultan of SWAT, who's a dead pull hitter, next. Sunbury Motors Hyundai asks, what import brand is the must-have vehicle in the Susquehanna Valley? Toyota. April Fools. Honda. April Fools. Subaru. April Fools. It's Hyundai. That's no April Fools. If you want to have a fun day, you have to drive a Hyundai. Stop in Sunbury Motors Hyundai and see why Hyundai offers more features, more selection, and more choices than any other import brand. Sunbury Motors Hyundai is taking up to $5,050 off $2,000. 2018 Hyundai Santa Fe's, and they start at 25560 Start your spring off right with a brand new Hyundai Veloster. Sunbury Motors Hyundai has seven in stock, starting at 17495 Or a 2018 Hyundai Elantra, starting at 15730 with 13 in stock. And they all have America's best warranty, 10 years, 100,000 miles. Don't fall for April Fool's jokes. If you want to have a fun day, you have to drive a Hyundai. Sunbury Motors Hyundai in the North 4th Street Auto Plaza, Sunbury. Party time, game time, or just fun time. Doesn't matter what time it is because it's Brewers Outlet time. The Beverage Supermarket has the area's largest beer selection. Imports, microbrews, ciders, and domestics. Pick from over 100 ice-cold 12-packs and dozens of 24-ounce singles. Soda, snacks, hot sauces, fresh roasted peanuts. Make it one-stop party shopping and don't forget the pickle bar. So whatever you're celebrating or just doing it up, Brewers Outlet, Reagan Street, Sunbury wants to see you. And thank you for your years of patronage taking your calls at 800-795-9565 this is the steve jones show on news radio 1070 wkok now from the sunbury motor studio here's steve jones today's show brought to you by the great people at brewers outlet reagan street in sunbury the beverage supermarket it's blue white weekend stock up for your tailgate Imports, domestics, microbrews, best selection of beer anywhere. And great specials between now and Tuesday. Michelob Ultra 30 packs, $22.97. Shock Top Ruby Fresh Grapefruit 12 pack bottles, $8.95. Jack Daniels Cocktails 24 pack bottles, $24.95. And now available Budweiser Freedom Reserve Red Lager. Wine coolers, water, soft drinks, snacks. They roast their peanuts fresh and hot every day. The pickle bar led by the barrels and the dills absolutely is second to none. All at Brewers Outlet, Reagan Street, and Sunbury, the beverage supermarket. I'm in the Sunbury Motors studio. Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors, Key Roots 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Thanks to Ben Jones, StayCollege.com, who joined us in the 3.30 half hour. Joe Marino, draft analyst for FanRagSports.com in the previous half hour. Monday, Bucknell football coach Joe Susan will join us to wrap up Bucknell spring drills. Greg Pickle will be here to talk about the blue-white game. Adam Purdy on the Purdy Memorial Golf Tournament on Tuesday. Tony Knopp, CEO of Spotlight Ticket Management on the Business of Sports, coming up on Wednesday. But are they really better guests than the Sultan of Swat himself? Hey, man. Sorry to hear about your friend. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Uh, Gil was very special to me because I probably learned more about uh, the craft of play-by-play. Look, I had great mentors. Fran Fisher was a great mentor. John Grant was a great mentor. I probably learned more sitting in the, just sitting in the booth with Gil uh, in four years of being in a living play-by-play classroom than anyone else. And then he also took the time to listen to my tapes and say, hey, why don't you try this? I like that. I mean, he was uh, he was special and obviously a legend, one of the best. Uh, Patriot fans certainly have missed him, although uh, Bob Sochi and I had a really great text uh, message 
back and forth this morning because I'm, I'm, I'm a big Bob Sochi guy, so Bob was the perfect person to step in after Gil retired. Uh, Sean had asked me earlier in the afternoon if I had any um, Gil Santos stories to share him, and I'd never met him. I didn't know anything, of, you know, except he was a Patriots announcer and stuff. But the one thing that always struck me about him was he was the first person that wowed me when you said, oh, I know Gil Santos. Oh, I work with Gil Santos. I'm like, wow, you know Gil Santos? You know, And, that, yeah. and how much he meant to you and how much you learned from him. And that's what I took from your relationship with him is he was very good to you. And oh, absolutely. He gave you the time of day, and that's that's a compliment to him and who he was. So, um. Absolutely. Like I said, it was like being in a living classroom with him for four years. But again, then he'd take a high school tape and he'd take it and he'd go over it. And we kept in touch over the years. And, yeah. uh, and I, I mentioned earlier in the show that when he got really sick uh, a couple of years ago, now that he, actually, he actually came back from this. He had double pneumonia, and they had put him into a medically induced coma, I think. Wow. And Roberta, his wife, got a hold of me. And she said "I that she came up with this idea that people who mean something to him, if we could each write letters to him. Mm-hmm. So, I, so I did. And the idea was is that she would read him the letters, and then when he came out of it, then reread it to him as to what each one of us wrote. Uh, I think the last time I talked to him, I want to say is a little more than a year ago. And I said to him, I said, so how are things? He goes, well, Stefano, I'm retired. He says, you know what I found out? I'm really good at it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, good for him. Uh, Unfortunately, he couldn't enjoy more of it. So. Hey, you yeah. know who came in the, here the other day? Mr. Kerkorian. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> he said to say hi. I said I'll say his name on the radio. So, <laughs> oh, wow, I waited. You know how his dry sense of humor. I waited 90 years. <laughs> he's, he's 90 years old. He yeah. says, so you're living over in the house. Right next to the field, he said, "I knew the people who had the horses there." <laughs> like, Holy yeah, I know. cow! He, <laughs> it's he the forest had, now. <laughs> yeah, I know. He, <laughs> now, he always had that Boston accent. Yeah, it, it, oh, it was fascinating. I had a nice time with him. Um, he was here no. for about an hour. Uh, so, oh, yeah, good man. Very good. Oh, uh, he's doing good. He's still kicking. I mean, you heard about Debbie, right? No. Oh. Um. Oh, geez. What a great show you're having today. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's obviously something bad must have happened to her. So. Yeah. She was driving down Route 91 oh. in Enfield and had a seizure and died wow. in a car accident two years oh, ago. That's, that's awful. Yeah. That he was living with her. So he's had to deal with that. You know, the loss that's of a child is just. You know. Devastating, yeah, man. Devastating. Now we'll flip it to the the other end of it. All right. Hey, my granddaughter Lauren. Yeah, she's turning ten this week. Wow, ten. <laughs> John. Okay, I remember when her mother was ten. <laughs> You're gonna be a great grandfather, man. That's how cool is that. <laughs> Finally graded something. <laughs> even if it was just in title. <laughs> wow. Ten years old. I know. She looks just like Jenny. I know she does. Yeah, it's very pretty. Does. Yeah. yeah. It's like, holy man. So I said to her today, I said, you're going to be ten years old. You're going to be double digits. Wow. Ten years old. I know. Yeah. The dad, uh, no. Dad never saw her. Yeah. Uh, no, Dad did not, because Dad passed away 14 years 2004, ago. 2004, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
All right. Well, no, 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 no. Let's change it. How about them Red Sox? I'm getting all depressed, and I'm going to start crying and stuff. Oh. How about those Red Sox? You know what's interesting? You want to know what's it, last year they were a good but not great hitting team. In fact, I thought they were a good, not great team last year. They won the division, but they're they're only good. Um, and the Red Sox and the Yankees both had the same philosophy at the plate for years, where the idea was pitches. to drive up pitch counts yep. with the idea that you would get the 95 to 100 pitches by the fifth inning, and they'd have to take you out, and then the soft underbelly of the bullpen they'd attack and get to. Right. Last year, the Red Sox and the Dodgers, the Dodgers were one, the Red Sox were two, at not swinging at pitches. Right? In fact, the Red Sox philosophy was they'd take a strike first before they'd swing. Right. Well, Al- Alex Cora comes in, and the Red Sox now are swinging at 70% of the pitches they're seeing. And they are driving the ball. Uh, now, obviously, I watched them against Otani the other night. And I, I don't care if it's two innings, but I, w- I was still impressed with Otani because I felt like, you know, you could see the basics, 95 to 100 fastball. He just didn't have any control in his secondary pitches. He had two extra days of rest, and I think that bothers a pitcher. Uh, so, But he, he, he can throw a curve. That. Yeah, he can throw a curveball. He can throw a slider, and, he's, and when he's on, he has a really good split. His split was terrible the other night. And I think that's, again, part of that is – too much rest. Uh, but they attacked him. Mookie Betts hit three home runs. Brock Holt, you know, obviously, you know, you know, I'm a big Brock Holt guy because Brock played here. Uh, he homered. Jackie Bradley homered. I mean, and you know, Jay, last night, J.D. Martinez homered. And they've got pitching. Porcello's bounced back. Price has been pretty good. Sale is sale. They well, got I think closer. J.D. Martinez is a big key in that lineup. Doesn't matter what he hits, he's there. And they did not have that big bat last year no. at all. Uh, and what you learned is Mookie Betts and uh, uh, the shortstop. I can never pronounce it. Xander Bogarts. Yeah. They can't carry a team. They no. can when they have somebody in the lineup with them. They were they were great with Big Poppy, but Big yeah. Poppy was gone. Now you put Martinez in, he's always a threat. And that big bopper in the lineup's huge for the Red Sox. Darn it all! <laughs> well, yeah, it's because I mean that's, that they they never did replace Ortiz at all last year. Uh, nah, um, one quick JD Martinez story: State College this year is hosting the New York Penn League All Star Game, so I'll be doing that game on the 14th of August uh, here in State College. The yep. last time they hosted it was in 2009. I mentioned Brock Holt; he was in the All Star Game that year, representing State College. The guy representing Tri-City that year was J.D. Martinez. So we had a get-together, a luncheon at Beaver Stadium. And I I go over, and J.D. Martinez is looking out, and he looks at me, and he says, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Look at this. (laughs) So so he got got a big kick out of seeing 110,000 seats. Wow. They're human beings like everybody else, you know. Oh, no doubt. Yeah. But 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 look, they're they're a good team. It's early on. Uh, I'm fascinated by what – I'll tell you a team that fascinates me is the Phillies. I want to see if this – the depth of analytics that he wants to use really can be used. I don't know. I mean, mean, he uses – I mean, he uses analytics – to make a lineup, he uses analytics on positioning. He uses analytics as to whether to run a guy. Nah, I've never know, Gabe Kapler who played for the Red Sox. A lot ago. of times, you got to play baseball by gut, and you need an equal mixture of all of them. Just like you're saying, taking pitches and not taking pitches, and you got to find an equal medium, and you got to do it right. Analytical is good, but you also got to manage with your gut. You know, well, I think you have to have instinct, um, and this yeah, is and interesting because I mean, take take Aaron Boone who's managing the Yankees. He's never managed before. No. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's interesting. I mean, uh, Kapler did manage one year of the minors, but that was eleven years ago. One year, and he came back then to play in the majors after that. I mean, yeah. You've got guys managing that 
have not managed at levels before, but it is different managing at the lower levels of the minors because you are expected to look. It's it's developmental. I've got to play everybody here at some point. It's you can't just run out your best lineup every day and say, "Hey, look, we're going to ro- roll through this like a hot knife through butter." Is this Gabe Kapler you're talking about? Yeah. They're winning because they're afraid of him. <laughs> this guy's a monster. <laughs> <laughs> well, having Jake, well, having Jake Arrieta on the mound last night and striking out ten. That that <laughs> that, yeah, that guy can help you too. Yeah. So, you yeah, will Maurice strike Hoskins, out ten tonight he, or he crushed oh. one last night. <laughs> Kapler's built like a bodybuilder. Yeah, he is. Wow. Yeah, Reese yeah, Hoskins, he is. Hoskins is turning into a true leader in this team. That that says something. Yeah. Well, again, oh. same thing. We saw him at Williamsport, and he was one of those guys. I think Roger asked me about him once. And, you know, like, who, who am I looking at? And I mentioned Roman Quinn, and I mentioned a couple of other guys. And Hoskins has always been a guy I mentioned to him. I said, watch this guy. This guy has bat speed. You can see the bat speed in him. I think it's amazing how a city can be down for so long, and all of a sudden they win a Super Bowl. The basketball team is everybody's little favorite. Um, now the baseball team, you know, from the bottom to the top real quick. And the, um, I don't know, nothing. I got nothing on Now the hockey team is at, <laughs> I mean, Villanova won in basketball. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah, I mean, Villanova. That- yeah, Villanova won. I'll be honest with you. Uh, I actually w- like watching how the Sixers play. I mean, they're a very well, unselfish team. What's his name? Stanton? The... Ben Simmons. The... Joel ben Simmons. He's tremendous. Yeah. 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 So. And he makes everybody around him better. If he can somehow get himself a consistent 15- to 20-foot jump shot, oh. Uh-huh. Yeah. No, they got punched in the mouth last night down in Miami, and they they really didn't let that uh, you know get in their heads. And they that was a very impressive fourth quarter. Oh, they they played really well last night. That they won quarter, last night. Yeah, they won last night at Miami. They won. In fact, they won comfortably when it all turned out. Dwayne Wade was really irritating me the other night. I don't. It was one point last night, third quarter. He only had like two points. Yeah, he's acting like the he's the old Dwayne Wade. I'm like, Wade, be careful, you know. <laughs> you're not the old Dwayne Wade. You're you're making like you're going to take this team out. No, you're not. So he's <laughs> and he didn't. I am just locked in on the Stanley Cup. I'm just that well, the, fascinates me. And the Bruins have played great. To me, the the most fascinating story is Vegas. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. That's who I, I was going to say. I love watching Vegas play. It's Vegas is just, uh, how many, I mean, I know the age of free agency and, you know, I mean, they got Pittsburgh's goaltender. They got, you know, they got a lot of a lot of players, but to mesh the way they have so quickly is amazing. I loved what Bob Grove said yesterday. He compared it to Leicester City winning the Premier League a couple of years yeah. ago. I mean, it's yeah. it's true on on that yeah. on that big on on the on the scope of them winning so far this season. I mean, that's uh, you know. Well, every team could only protect one goaltender in the expansion draft, so that's how they got Flurry. And the key to getting Flurry is they made a deal with the Penguins that that would be the only player off the Penguins they would take. Well, well, it was a good player. I heard they already have like a statue of him, whatever. <laughs> I'm telling you, what a place! Yeah, it's right next to the statue of the slot machine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's in one of the hotels. I think it's like a sta- it's like a statue of chocolate or something. I forget yeah, one of the hotels. Oh, yeah. the Bellagio. Yeah, the Bellagio. <laughs> it's yeah, like a forty a... foot tall statue of Flurry oh, in bl- chocolate. <laughs> the Bellagio has a chocolate waterfall. It's yes, a, I've they been do. there once. It is unbelievable. Yeah. I cannot imagine Vegas having all these professional sports teams, it will be the wildest city in the world. I'm telling you. It was to have successful teams once the Raiders get there, oh my gosh. But And that's all going to be in the same here. area because it's that vacant lot that's next to MGM, MGM. When you come out of the airport, there's a big lot there. That's where they want to build the football stadium. And on the other side of the strip is where T-Mobile Arena is because that, that arena was almost finished uh, wow. when I was there uh, two years ago. If Vegas sustains the success 
into next year and the year after that, I would think that that would put even more pressure on the Raiders to be successful after they make that move, right? Yeah. I think it puts a lot of pressure on Seattle when they get an NHL expansion team. You better be as good as they are. <laughs> oh, I think it's great. Hey, guess who's coming to East Windsor? I Stormy Daniels. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Uh, you gotta be just kidding, so right? everyone knows, East Windsor is way off Broadway. <laughs> East Windsor. It's like the smallest town in Connecticut. It's just going to some strip club there. It's right down the road here. It's like a mile from where I used to live. So it's about five miles from here. The night that she performs there, go down to the club and kind of kind of take a selfie in front of the sign with Stormy Daniels on it. Oh, I'm not saying geez. I'm not saying go in, but <laughs> I'm not going in. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Just for fun. No? Okay. Come no. on, who cares? So oh, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> I, I well, thought of it. I couldn't believe it. One of the guys here told, Oh, you know who told me? Johnny Krikorian told me. <laughs> oh, dude. He's 90 years old. He knows. <laughs> He's 90. He goes, <laughs> Stormy Daniels is coming to, <laughs> to East Windsor. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, my goodness. <laughs> and then you're, so and then you're going? And then your next, yeah, so. <laughs> your next question. <laughs> you're going? Guys, night out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because uh was it mm, seven weeks ago i went i actually went over to trump tower because dick girardi wanted to go i've been to trump tower before yeah, uh, a couple before. times yeah. and so everything's gold dick, dick girardi hadn't been there before and he says well can you get in i said oh yeah i can get in i said there's probably a metal detector and there was no, I mean, was, when we went over, there was nobody around. So, I mean, we, we breezed through the metal detector. It was almost like a speed bump. You can so get in, get... but you can only go up the elevator to, like, 15 floors or oh, something. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, we, just went, we, just, we just took the escalators and so forth and went up. It's right. the, the, um, it, it had been a mall before, but I think since yeah. they won the presidency, those upper two floors where the stores were, they had to close yep. them out. Oh uh, really? But but, yeah. but Dick, but Dick wanted to, to go down the escalator and wave. <laughs> so he so he did. I was like, I said, I'll I'll give you all the room you want. <laughs> but you're on yeah. a lot of videotape right now, Dick. <laughs> yeah. Oh, believe me, he doesn't care. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't care. <laughs> he will have eight guys in long black trench coats show up at his house. <laughs> Oh. No, he just waved. He was good. Yeah. No, it's a tourist attraction. It's always been a tourist attraction. You can only get to so much of it, and then um, you're you're out. But. Well, I told I told you the Dave Baker story, right? No. Okay, so this is years ago now. Years ago, Penn State's in the NIT Final Four, and it's that off day between the semifinals and the final. So, look, we got time to kill. So we go down to up 6th Avenue, then we're coming down 5th Avenue. And this is when FAO Schwartz was there. Yeah. And, you know, and we go past Tiffany, and there's Trump Tower. So we go into Trump Tower, and like, okay, fine. We go all the way up how many floors or whatever and look at, you know, the stores and whatever, killing time. And so now we're coming down the infamous escalator, and Dave's talking to me in the escalator. Okay, fine. And I see this limousine pull up. And out of the limousine is Donald Trump. Cool. So Donald Trump is talking to somebody. And he's looking to his right. He's a, a tall man. He's about 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, and, he, and he's looking to his right, talking to this guy. And Dave is on my left. And Dave is looking at me, talking to me. And neither one sees each other. And boom! <laughs> <laughs> right at <into> each other. <laughs> I said, geez, Dave, you could have lifted his wallet, something. We had a good time. Yeah. Did I ever tell you what happened in Fort Lauderdale? No. My, me and my friend Tom Cancelosi, we, we were down there and uh, with spring break, and we decided to rent a uh, moped. So we're scooting around on the moped. He's riding on the back, or I, I, or maybe he was driving. I don't know what. But we see this guy walking down the street, 
go into a hotel and he's got a fisherman's hat on. You know, those old, like, beach hats? Yeah, right. And we're going, is it him? Is it him? And we come up alongside him and we tipped right over and landed on him. It was Yogi Berra. <laughs> 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 we go, yeah, it is him. And he just looked at us. He smiled. He kind of shuffled away and then he just uh, kind of like said, have a good day, boys, and kept on walking. <laughs> That's when the Yankee spring training was in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. So. How about That's my that? closest brush with fame, I guess. I don't know. You know, uh, well, I guess for Jack years, for, you. for years, Jack, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> for, for years, Yogi told that story about you guys. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure he remembers. These two yeah. guys. <laughs> well, they got our uh, valid, made it valid today. Thank God. <laughs> at three three o'clock tomorrow, the blue white game. It'll be on Eagle One Hundred and Seven tomorrow. Eagle One Hundred and Seven at three o'clock tomorrow. Jack Cam, Derek Williams, and I will be on hand for the game the scrimmage. From three to five, Keegan Michael Key is the honorary coach tomorrow. It should be an interesting time, and we'll give you as much info as possible on as many players as possible tomorrow. Have a great weekend, everyone! Today's show brought to you by Brewers Outlet, Reagan Street in Sunbury, the beverage supermarket. A News Radio 1070 WKOK in the Sunbury Motor Studio. It's great to have you on board with us every day of the week. Your station for news, weather, business, and CBS Sports Radio. News Radio 1070 WKOK Sunbury and on WKOK.com.